So what I wanted to talk about today, is, as Annie suggested, is uh, you know I entitled the talk "Putting the Test in Test and Treat," um, but the idea is to discuss. Uh, so some of the innovations in HIV testing that are happening in San Francisco. And the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the current HIV testing environment in San Francisco that actually is uh, characterized by a couple of uh, really important initiatives that are really sort of unique and e explain how uh, HIV testing in San Francisco uh, is uh, is happening right now. And the second part of my talk, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the directions that HIV is testing, specifically focusing not on the sort of uh, you know two or three or four years out you know tests coming down the pike or thing, but things that are actually available and uh, changes in in CDC policies and things that are coming down the pike that you all are going to be seeing in the next 12 months. So between now and the time uh, that you see me next, uh, I suspect that everything I talk about today will become uh, clinically relevant uh, to, to most of you. So um, first of all, th we have a national HIV AIDS strategy, uh, which I think er most of us are, are familiar with, uh, which focuses on uh, uh, all of our uh, public resources on uh, reducing the, the goals of reducing new HIV infections, increasing access to care, uh, and improving health outcomes, and reducing HIV-related health disparities. Um, it, specifically with regard to reducing uh, new HIV infections, uh, the, uh, the goals are targeting the most affected communities, combination prevention uh, uh, efforts, and education. And in San Francisco, the context in which those have to be applied is that we've got uh, about 6,000 uh, individuals living with HIV and 8,000 living with AIDS. But most of the people living with HIV and AIDS in the city uh, know their status. Uh, so this is. Uh, in stark contrast to a lot of other uh, urban uh, MSM and, and uh, other urban uh, epidemics uh, as w and, and rural epidemics uh, in the U.S. Moreover, uh, in San Francisco, uh, where it's a, a, uh, dominated uh, by uh, MSM transmission, uh, the 79% uh, of uh, uh, MSM uh, who are HIV positive uh, uh, report either no unprotected anal intercourse at all or unprotected anal intercourse only with other HIV positive uh, people. Uh, and by uh, 2009, about two thirds were on ART, and about 60% of uh, all uh, the people living with HIV uh, and AIDS in San Francisco were virally suppressed, uh, indicating uh, very limited uh, transmission potential. Uh, despite all of this, uh, as of uh, the mid-2000s through about 2009, uh, the data uh, coming out of the uh, HIV surveillance branch at uh, the Department of Health uh, suggested uh, relatively steady HIV incidence, about 500 to 600 MSM cases in San Francisco per year. This despite a really, if you think about what people talk about as sort of the goals of, and optimistic goals of test and treat implementation uh, strategies in Africa, for instance, this is actually a pretty optimistic uh, looking scenario. Uh, and despite that, there was ongoing transmission. So our efforts need to focus on, on that. In San Fran and I, I want to uh, also highlight the fact that here, you know, it, this, this is a, a map of uh, HIV infections, uh, and it, it clearly shows the concentration in a, in a few neighborhoods here uh, where there's uh, high incidence, no surprise to anybody in this audience. So HIV testing uh, currently in San Francisco is part of a combination prevention in keeping with uh, national uh, strategy with a special emphasis, uh, thanks in, in large part to the collaboration between uh, our, our own leadership in the PHP, Diane and Brad's efforts working with uh, the, the Department of Health uh, under uh, Grant's, Grant Colfax's leadership uh, to implement uh, guidelines for uh, uh, very early uh, initiation, as early as possible initiation of antiretroviral therapy uh, as a universal uh, strategy and, and part of a, 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 the, a really the linchpin of a, a very aggressive uh, combination prevention uh, 
strategy uh, in San Francisco. Um, but the testing effort that uh, is intended to, to uh, complement the, the treatment effort in this test and treat uh, program uh, is uh, focused on, first of all, in intensifying targeted testing uh, in the communities with the highest uh, HIV burden with more frequent uh, testing and expanded testing uh, services for uh, high risk MSM. So what that means is uh, increasing the number of, of tests and the opportunities for testing uh, and encouraging more frequent testing at sites like Magnet, which was shown in this slide right in the heart of, of the Castro, and AIDS Health Project, San, uh, San Francisco City Clinic. Um, these are the, the public sites that serve very large numbers of high risk, uh, the highest risk MSM. Uh, also in those same sites, increasing the use of acute HIV testing, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, but in addition to that effort to intensify services for the high risk MSM, uh, who, where, uh, where HIV transmission uh, is clearly greatest, there's also an effort to address health disparities uh, by seeking out those who are not currently accessing testing in San Francisco uh, with an effort uh, specifically on expanding uh, testing in medical settings, the care environments where the patients who are currently not perhaps accessing that testing get, uh, do currently access uh, care. And then finally, developing a program uh, to actively link patients to care. There's uh, been uh, a concerted effort. Nick Moss, I see, uh, is in, in the back. Uh, and uh, Nick and company over at the DPH are uh, leading what's called the LINCS team, which is a new, uh, new, newly sort of uh, active and live uh, uh, program for uh, active linkage and sort of transitional case management and linkage to care of, of newly HIV positive uh, individuals. So uh, there, there's actually a whole lot going on. So f to, to give you a, a, a snapshot of what's happening now with regard to the efforts to intensify testing, uh, focusing on the, the uh, three largest sites, uh, mo the DPH has invested significantly in increased resources for those sites. At Magnet, uh, for instance, the, the testing has increased from about 3,000 tests per year uh, two years ago to 9,000 tests per year uh, expected this year. So the testing has in increased both in, uh, in terms of uh, the, the uh, both by increasing the, the, you know, the, the number of hours and the number of staff and, and so forth, um, uh, but uh, also by encouraging uh, frequent and much more frequent testing, uh, as opposed, uh, so, so encouraging testing every three to six months for high-risk MSM. So thanks to more testers and more frequent testing, uh, the, they, they've seen this increase in testing volume, and, and they're certainly on track uh, to, to meet their, go their uh, programmatic goals. Uh, in terms of the, the number of uh, increased tests. In terms of uh, it, it, the, the testing uh, th that's happening at, at Magnet, AHP, uh, and uh, the San Francisco City Clinic involves uh, something that, that's called the STOP study. And this is a CDC-funded initiative, really, uh, with a, a laboratory-based uh, study built on top of it. Patients come in, they just get tested, but under the STOP protocol, they get tested with uh, a whole panel, uh, essentially every available most sensitive uh, HIV test there is. They get an antibody test, they get RNA in case they are still seroconverting and not yet uh, antibody positive. They uh, then get a, a panel of other uh, antibody tests, you know, uh, confirmatory supplemental tests, and a fourth gen uh, antigen antibody uh, immunoassay, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but the, the one thing I want to mention is that under this, this laboratory protocol for handling the, the specimens coming from uh, uh, Magnet and City Clinic, uh, uh, there have been 209 uh, cases uh, according to uh, the most recent uh, data uh, from, and, and Nick here is, is the PI of uh, the San Francisco uh, STOP program. And of two, the 209 uh, cases just this year, uh, 39 or 19 percent uh, were HIV antibody negative acute infection. This is um, th this is really uh, e extremely remarkable, and it's remarkable for two main reasons. One is that it's really different 
than what the city has seen in the past. So some, there's something very different going on here. If you look at uh, the, the testing uh, with, which we reviewed from 2004 to 2008 for a previous paper, uh, the uh, rate of HIV antibody negative acute infection that would correspond to, th to these results was about 5%. There were some additional rapid test, you know, oral fluid rapid test negative patients with chronic infection who were also detected by RNA that time. But it was really only about 5%. Of, of the testing population that was uh, acutely infected by the same definition as we're talking about here. The second reason why it's so remarkable that 20% of you know, one in five HIV infections coming in and getting identified at, at Magnet um, and City Clinic right now appear to be uh, antibody negative acute infections is that the antibody tests we're talking about are very, very sensitive. They turn positive about three to four weeks after infection. So the, the window of opportunity to be diagnosed as being in this window where you're HIV RNA positive and antibody negative is at most seven to 10 days. So we're talking about one in five HIV infections currently coming in and getting identified at these testing sites being in a 10-day window. This is very, very strange and uh, really remarkable. Uh, and uh, I, there, there may be several reasons. I think one of the most important probably relates to the increased frequency of testing. They are the highest risk MSM are being encouraged to come in frequently and test every, every three months. So I, I, uh, yeah? I was wondering if there's like, uh, patients who are not symptomatic or if you don't have that data. Um, I don't have that data, and I think actually those data aren't being collected currently as part of this. Um, but it's, it's a really important question. I do know that there's no specific campaign. There's been no specific publicity, unless I'm mistaken, to encouraging patients to come in for nothing. But, but whether patients are coming in you know, because of sort of word of mouth and the street wisdom <laughs> um, in the community that they can get tested for acute HIV? Um, I don't know. It's a really good, good question. Um, and I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the sort of, you know, is there, you know, are we seeing the rise of acute HIV in a moment? Um, I, I did want to talk about the other piece of HIV testing and the DPH program in San Francisco right now, and that is that all the efforts that are going on at, you know, the, 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 in the red hot burning core of the epidemic over in the Castro and you know, at HP and Magnet and City Clinic, um, those only access the same general population uh, of patients who are currently testing, uh, which is to say uh, the, um, uh, the, the largely white, uh, oops, sorry, largely white, uh, permanently housed and uh, insured and repeat testing uh, population. Those are the, the characteristics down here of patients who uh, do uh, currently test at public testing sites. Uh, this is data that was provided to me by uh, Sandy Schwartz recently. Uh, this is unpublished data looking at uh, documentation of an HIV test uh, by looking at uh, white versus black and Latino. Uh, patients. First of all, you see that uh, black, both blacks and Latinos are overrepresented relative to the proportion uh, of the same uh, groups in the uh, 2000 census. They're overrepresented among uh, our people living with HIV AIDS in San Francisco. Uh, and, but moreover, there is significantly lower proportion among the new diagnoses in those groups of patients who've ever who've tested before in the la any time in the last two years and tested negative. Uh, moreover, there's a significantly higher proportion in both groups compared to white clients of patients who, when they're diagnosed, already have a CD4 count less than 350. They already have advanced disease. So there clearly are, in addition to HIV, rela HIV care-related disparities uh, for uh, African American and Latino. Uh, patients, there are also testing disparities. And this, you, you can't say this uh, particularly uh, reflects lack of access to testing per se, because there's all kinds of testing going on. There are 9,000 tests a year at Magnet. But it's lack of testing that 
those populations effectively access. So how do you seek uh, the untested HIV uh, positive population to get them into care. And actually, there's, there's a, some people talk about test and treat. Other people talk about testing and linkage to care. Other people talk about seek, test, and treat. So this is sort of the seek part of the, the test and treat uh, thing. One, one strategy that the DPH has embraced, which I think is really uh, kind of exciting from a, if you're a testing wonky kind of person, um, is uh, focusing on uh, HIV testing as a quality indicator for care in the public clinics. So we have a lot of a substantial proportion of the indigent care in San Francisco is delivered in public clinics like the COPC, which is the network of um, public clinics um, served by, uh, by uh, San Francisco General uh, and DPH. Uh, and so they've recently in instituted a CQI indicator, a, a core indicator for their, uh, for, uh, for primary care and among adult uh, uh, outpatients getting primary care who are, so this is the connected group uh, of um, patients served by the public clinics. Uh, only about half have ever uh, tested for HIV. So this uh, indicates a, a substantial uh, potential opportunity for improvement there. And the fact that we're tracking it now and it's a core indicator, I think is a, a really terrific uh, idea and that's real progress. However, the, <laughs> it's important to realize that primary care uh, only accesses patients who are connected. And so some of our patients, uh, you know, don't test because they're connected to care, but most of them, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of patients uh, are HIV infected in uh, the midst of chaotic like life circumstances uh, that may not permit them to be effectively linked to primary care at one of these clinics. So a lot of people uh, in, uh, who are at high risk of HIV receive their primary, uh, their, their primary care really in drop-in clinic settings. So ambulatory care environments. And in ambulatory care environments, the urgent care centers, the emergency department, so where the barriers to HIV testing are unbelievable. There's been a, a terrific effort here at San Francisco General in particular, but uh, th it's really quite unique. And the, the reason is that uh, it, it is obvious to anybody who, who has ever spent any time uh, caring for patients in, in an urgent care center or emergency room. There's just not time. And moreover, there's, not, uh, there, there's a perception that HIV testing, uh, and I think this is in, in really correct, that HIV testing is a, uh, a public health uh, screening function, in, and so is analogous not to uh, the influenza test, which is done for symptomatic patients, right? Part of good care, but is more like a, sc a screening colonoscopy, or uh, you know, fecal blood, uh, occult blood screening, or a screening, uh, a screening mammogram. Those are not tests that you're ever going <laughs> to convince an ER doctor or an urgent care doctor or their administrators to endorse performing in ambulatory care. So the question is, is are there opportunities for, uh, a, a for capturing HIV infections and increasing early recognition of HIV infections in those type of environments, which is where a lot of uh, uh, the, the H high risk and H unrecognized HIV positive population in San Francisco receive their care? And there may be, and that's sort of the, the punchline for this, so stay tuned to the end of the talk. I mean, stay, stay in your seats till you're excused. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, the, the um, testing in medical settings, the San Francisco General actually has one of the most um, uh, robust and uh, really leading uh, programs in the country. Uh, and it, it relies on a model that, I, that many of us are used to now, but are not necessarily uh, familiar with how unique it is. Um, n there is really no place else in the country that does things quite the way San Francisco General does. The key features of this hospital's testing program are the rapid return of results, and the, the, which relies on a staffing model, um, which is really unique. It is, they don't do batch testing. They don't do, you know, they don't wait until they fill up a strip 
of 20 tests or you know, a, a plate of 100 tests before they run their HIV tests. They use only rapid tests. So they only do tests that they can do in singlet. Right? So what they do is they wait, they have a, a two hourly schedule. Every two hours they go to the bucket. If there's an HIV test requisition in the bucket, they take the blood, they do the rapid test right there. In 10, 20 minutes, they put the result in the computer and the patients are either preliminary uh, positive on the rapid antibody test or they're uh, HIV negative. Um, this is a, uh, so, so, so that's a, a key feature. The, the problem, of course, is you can't do HIV RNA testing and you uh, can't use traditional immunoassays, which require these sort of batch testing runs uh, with this. However, they, they have been, uh, we, we, CAT has recently published uh, results showing that uh, the testing was quite accurate, relying on, on the rapid uh, testing alone. Uh, and furthermore, um, the, the, the second feature that uh, CAT emphasized as a key to uh, uh, both increasing the, the testing numbers, uh, with the numbers you see here from you know, 500 a month a couple years ago to 2,500 a month currently uh, in the hospital lab, uh, is the efforts of the FAST team. Um, the FAST team uh, we're all very proud of, uh, and they uh, are really the key to uh, having ensured high rates of provider acceptance for ordering HIV tests because they take that the onus of disclosure in most cases off of the providers and, and that's a key factor in terms of uh, promoting HIV testing uh, in, in these testing settings. So the, the SFGH model is really uh, uh, g gaining a lot of notoriety and uh, I think where there's an HIV diagnostics conference coming up uh, in a month in Atlanta, and I suspect that there's going to be a lot of uh, further discussion about that model. So I, I promised some, so that's, this is all what's happening. So, so far, you know, ho-hum, nothing very exciting. Okay, so the question is, where, what are we, uh, where are we going and what are we looking at in the next year? What are you, what are you guys gonna see? One thing I did wanna um, focus on is that the epidemic may be shifting uh, underneath our feet, um, the, the sands on which we stand right now. Um, the, uh, the, the whole test and treat idea, which is now sort of being implemented aggressively in San Francisco, uh, uh, it was based on this, this very bold uh, uh, model from Greenwich. It was not actually the first paper to show this result and it's sort of curious that it was as sort of widely influential as it was, but it hit at just the right time when there were, people were ready to think about treating everybody. And it showed that if you tested it and, and treated uh, patients uh, universally in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's only 20% coverage currently, uh, that the epidemic, uh, it, as opposed to what would happen if you treated everybody with a CD4 count uh, below 350, if you treated absolutely everybody, you could actually eradicate the epidemic they predicted by this mathematical model in 50 years. So very exciting, very influential. Um, so uh, Diane en uh, enrolled uh, uh, Edwin Charlebois, our uh, epidemiologist over at CAPS, as well as Travis Porco, uh, a, a mathematical modeler, and, and Mopoli Das, um, who now is at the, the DPH. Uh, to uh, model ex what, what we might uh, expect to see in San Francisco. And she, uh, th they approached this by asking uh, the, the, a mathematical model of, you know, d designed to simulate characteristics of the San Francisco epidemic. What would happen to new infections under, uh, how, many, how many, what proportion of new in infections, oops, could be averted under different strategies. One is uh, versus the, the standard of care. And the standard of care in 2009 uh, that, that went into the model was uh, current rates of HIV testing and uh, treatment at once patients reach 350 cells, CD4 cells. Uh, if, and, and what their model predicted was that if you increased 
the CD4 threshold to uh, 500 or went ahead and treated everybody, uh, within five years you could expect to see a sub really substantial reduction in the HIV uh, transmissions that would be expected. So up to half or more uh, of all of the new infections could be averted just by treating the patients already in care. And uh, if you treated but also tested everyone and got everybody who was being newly infected effectively uh, into care uh, and, and got them treated, you could achieve more. Uh, so, so that this is what was predicted uh, and what, I, what I'm trying to emphasize here is, is not that uh, you know, th there's some magic to these numbers. These, the, you know, these are the results of a mathematical model. It just shows, you know, th that treatment of those who are already in care could be expected in this model to have very rapid effects. And if this is true, you would expect a dramatic, re to already be seeing a very dramatic reduction just based on what we know about the increased coverage uh, uh, and increased uh, use of antiretroviral therapy in the last five years in San Francisco. Um, so they uh, concluded, uh, this is what they concluded. Now, all, this needs to be understood in the context of what we know about infectiousness and the stage of disease over the course of HIV infection. Um, what's been shown by all kinds of studies um, is that the uh, per contact uh, rates of, of HIV infection, this is, these are numbers for heterosexual transmission, are between uh, anywhere from, be, from 10 to 30 fold higher uh, during the, the uh, six months uh, or ten, between 10 weeks and six months of acute infection uh, as they are during the asymptomatic phase. And there is uh, some increase uh, associated with later stage disease as well in terms of per contact infectivity. This may be related to genital HIV burden, which we know uh, increases and decreases uh, pretty closely in parallel with what happens in blood. So that, that, that is over by about uh, 10 weeks after infection, that, that initial peak. However, there's also data that the per virion infectivity of the HIV that's in the blood and in the general secretions during the first six months of infection may be hundreds of fold higher than uh, uh, viruses from later in infection. And it may relate to their usage of the CCR5 receptor uh, and, or other envelope uh, characteristics. It's really not clear exactly what what uh, the, the, the causes of increased infectivity uh, are, and it's not clear what the duration is precisely of that <laughs> elevated uh, infectivity. But what is clear is that if you are testing and treating people, and you're, you're doing everything you can to increase the, the early detection of HIV for your, your infected population, which is what, you, what the testing part of testing and treating does, is you move everything to the left, and the more your average HIV-infected person looks like this, the more a acute HIV infectivity is what you're left dealing with. And this is, uh, this is uh, actually something that may be very consequential. HIV spreads in sexual networks, and it can spread like wildfire. Um, and I'll show you some data to support that I'm not just being um, uh, hy uh, what's hyperbolic, um, although I am. I, <laughs> but, but, but I'm not just being hyperbolic. Um, there, so this guy here is blue, right? So he's blue, and so he, this is a chronically HIV-infected person. It just happens to, uh, so let's say this is patient zero, okay? This is an early epidemic. Patient zero arrives in San Francisco, touches down, he's chronically infected, he infects one person. That person then is green, they're acutely infected, and uh, because of the elevated infectiousness during acute infection, they infect one person, that person infects somebody, they infect another person, and so on and so forth. What happens in the early phases of an epidemic, this is a contribution of transmission 
uh, that's attributable to the acute cases and non-acute cases. And this was modeled in an African epidemic, but the curve would look similar uh, looking at San Francisco. In the early days, it's 100% of the infections are attributable to acute HIV infections. Does that make sense? But as, as you gradually accumulate a substantial number of long-term infected patients who go unrecognized and continue transmitting in addition to the acute to acute to acute transmission, you start to get contributions of chronic infection. And gradually, chronic infections uh, here in this African heterosexual model uh, seem to overwhelm uh, the acute transmission. But in an early phase epidemic, acute HIV is how HIV is transmitted. It's just like a flu epidemic. It's just like uh, chicken pox in a, in a daycare. It's exactly the same thing, acute to acute to acute transmission. And that's the, the magnitude of, of the difference between acute and non-acute infectivity is such that that will always be the case. It's predictable in a new epidemic. So the question is, uh, where are where are we here? So we're we're now here, right? This is 2010. So is it here, or is it more like here, or what is it currently in an MSM setting? Um, the the only real world uh, information uh, that's really reliable, you know, that doesn't come from a mathematical simulation of some sort, is uh, at this point from. Uh, the, this study that was uh, published a while back uh, in JID, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the reference here for you, but it was Bluma Brenner uh, in uh, Montreal at McGill, and, and she had access to the public uh, testing, uh, a, a, a HIV genotyping archive, in which uh, the clinicians indicated whether patients were ac acutely infected or whether they were chronically infected. Uh, and they had access to all of the acute infections and a subset of the chronic infections who were genotyped uh, in Montreal. Uh, and this is an epidemic, an MSM epidemic, very similar in terms of its demographics to what we see in San Francisco. It's a small community um, and it's, it's heavily MSM um, and, and behaviors, risk behaviors are, are similar to what we see here. Uh, they had about 600 acute infections and a similar number of uh, chronically infected patients in uh, the, the database, and uh, what they did is look at all of the genotypes and do an, uh, a phylogenetic analysis where they identified little clusters of wh where one sequence seemed to match up with another. Bottom line is that the primary HIV infection patients uh, clustered uh, in about half of cases with other primary HIV infection clusters. There are two explanations for that, uh, and, and very few uh, were seen rel in relative terms to cluster with chronically infected patients in the same database. So if you believe this ratio, it suggests that acute HIV completely dominates transmission in Montreal. There is oversampling because acute infection was an indication for genotyping. Uh, there was oversampling of the acute infections, so it, it may be an artifact of that. It's also uh, not necessarily the case that every single acute infection uh, that's linked to another acute infection in, the, in this sequence tree is the result of an acute to acute transmission event. Uh, if you have two, one chronically infected super spreader who infects five people, they'll all be phylogenetically clustered together. They'll all have the same virus. Uh, it doesn't mean any one of them infected the other. So it's a little bit of, it, this is with a huge grain of salt. The point is there's something really uh, serious about the, the potential for outbreaks of HIV, for clusters of HIV to emerge and for rapid fire transmission to occur either in parallel or in series. Um, and we often think of HIV transmission as happening sort of as a tonic, phenomenon over time for individuals as they're infected and that if, if we just, um, you know, treat, uh, yeah, go ahead, Gabe. Uh, just a, one question at the time about yeah. the proportion versus the prevalence, yeah. or, you know, the absolute number, where just if you treat all those people on the right with chronic infection or the test and treat model, you expect that there is still a contribution of those people, that'll damper down. Right. And the goal would be, oddly enough, get the 
the point where transmission is actually 100 percent from acute because that's who you're missing. The, I think. So, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so Gabe, Gabe, I, I didn't, I didn't want to suggest that uh, acute infections be uh, that if you drive down chronic infections with, uh, or, or the infectiousness of people with chronic infection, and eliminate their uh, contribution to transmission, that acute infection uh, would somehow take over, and then this would be worse. In fact, you, I, I think Diane's uh, model is, is actually probably uh, quite illustrative of what we can expect. I think we can expect treatment of chronic infection to dramatically reduce uh, HIV transmission. I, I, I certainly wouldn't argue that. What I would argue is that when the reductions, uh, and, and so, so Gabe made that point, uh, the, the reductions in HIV transmission, uh, to the extent that their, the, that treatment in chronic infection is effective at reducing HIV transmission, H, the incidence of HIV that remains will increasingly involve transmission by acutely infected people with a potential for explosive uh, outbreaks um, that would be similar in the terms of their potential to make things suddenly worse to uh, the situation in the early days of the epidemic. And this would sort of changes the the firefighting uh, operation to, you know, to, uh, from uh, a, uh, you know, a, a trying to tamp, you know, f f get rid of, of the raging uh, flames to trying to keep the, the smoldering ember, embers from suddenly reigniting and, and starting another fire. So what that uh, emphasizes is as transmission is reduced, acute infection becomes much more important, not only to test for, uh, but to act on. Uh, the the uh, potential for um, uh, disease intervention specialists and you know, uh, contact tracing um, people uh, in DPH to uh, effectively uh, deliver prevention services to acutely infected people or for prevention services to be delivered in the context of care for acutely infected people um, by either by providers, including uh, facilitators like the FAST uh, team, has a, will, I suspect, have an increasingly important role uh, in preventing HIV from resurging if it's, um, if we're, we're successful with our current treatment strategy. So I wanted to mention uh, two other uh, things now. So, that, so that's sort of setting the stage for what I really think is happening. I think things are moving under our feet. I think infections are coming down. Acute infection is becoming much more important. And that may be what we're seeing at, in Magnet. We haven't seen the, the rate of HIV, new HIV infections going up. We've seen the proportion that are acute dramatically uh, going up. We're, we're detecting more acute infections, relatively uh, fewer HIV. Uh, infections, if that makes sense. There are going to be some uh, major shifts in HIV testing policy uh, that are going to affect uh, everything in HIV testing in the coming year. The first is new algorithms. Um, we, uh, a number of us, have been involved in consultation on uh, the first new, re the first revision to HIV testing guidelines since 1993, and. Uh, what is coming out of this, um, I, I'm told that it's supposed to be released uh, by the end of this year, uh, but it, it, the MMWR is not yet out on this. But uh, it's now common knowledge uh, and has been for, for over a year uh, that the new uh, algorithms recommend uh, the use of either HIV RNA testing or uh, fourth generation immunoassays in high risk testing settings. And the criteria are somewhat loose for what constitutes a high-risk testing uh, setting, but this, the peninsula that we're on right now is one such setting. If you live in San Francisco, you're essentially a high-risk tester. So the, the new algorithms, the new guidelines for most, uh, for sexually active adults in San Francisco are basically going to recommend using a fourth generation immunoassay or uh, an HIV RNA test. The fourth generation immunoassays, uh, just uh, not 
to get away from the technical thing, uh, they, they detect uh, HIV antigens as well as antibodies. Uh, so they are, uh, they actually detect the virus before, as HIV antigen in the blood, before the antibodies turn uh, positive. So they are an alternative to HIV RNA screening for acute infection. Yep. Uh, so fourth generation rapid tests. Um, right now there are, uh, so it depends what you mean by a fourth generation rapid test. There is only one uh, rapid test currently that's being marketed uh, for, uh, f that, that detects HIV antigens. Um, and it has had a lot of negative publicity uh, because of uh, early experiences. Uh, with lack of specificity. Uh, so you get a lot of false positives with the antigen component on that particular test. They're not pushing for FDA approval in the US. It's not going to become available. What there is, however, uh, is, uh, well, let me, I'll go ahead and show you this, uh, is these things right here. These are uh, uh, a lot of the fourth generation uh, assays and one of the two uh, that's currently approved in the US, uh, the Abbott Architect is, is this one, uh, use what uh, was called a multi-platform analyzer. It's you know, an automated analyzer. Um, and the key to, use, to these automated analyzers is that they can be used in random access mode. And what a random access mode means is that you can take a single test and pop it on the machine. And it only takes a half an hour to develop and give you a, a result, positive or negative, on the first pass. So what that means is that it may not be a rapid test. You know, it's not a lateral flow test. It's not a point of care test. But if you're in a clinic that has access to a central laboratory, and that central laboratory has one of these, you can get rapid results, in some cases quicker than some uh, you know, rapid tests, oral fluid tests, et cetera. So uh, the possibility of rapid results algorithms on the fourth gen platform is there and is actually one of the, the key sort of new um, innovations. We've looked at uh, the performance in uh, San Francisco testing programs of this architect here. Um, and this is the, the combo uh, immunoassay. And we looked in a uh, sample uh, that was derived from testing 21,000 patients with uh, pooled RNA screening plus antibody testing, culling out the 54 uh, patients from that denominator who were HIV RNA positive and Western blot uh, negative or indeterminate. Uh, and uh, for compared with the HIV RNA gold standard uh, for detection of those acute infections, uh, we you know, looked at that panel and found that 89% uh, of those infections were actually detected using the architect. So we are uh, very confident that in San Francisco, uh, the, given the, the uh, amount of antigen that seems to be in the blood for the acutely infected patients coming in uh, to our testing sites, that the architect uh, is probably going to work uh, basically equivalent to HIV RNA. Gabe? Yeah, um, the the status is there are no there are I'm oh, sorry the the question was the availability of point of care viral load tests. Um, there are currently about five that are in uh, some state of uh, clinical evaluation. Um, so there actually they, there are several that are actually going into clinical trials uh, for. Uh, to, first to get the, the CE mark, which is the European approval. Uh, and uh, I know at least one, uh, Allier, that uh, is very likely to go for uh, a US FDA uh, indication as well. And uh, those tests will be intended for use both as AIDS and diagnosis, so acute infection screening, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, for viral load monitoring. There's the, the current generation of those tests that are, that are leading the charge and may be approved you know, in, in another year. That's like next, next year's talk. Those are the, the tests that are going to be available in you know, 2014. The, the problem with those tests is that they're all like these little toaster-sized machines, and they all take 
uh, like an hour to chug, chug away and spit out a result, and you get one result. And there are one, so if you want to do 10 tests, you have to have a rack of you know, 10 of these toaster-sized machines, and it, it, they're not point of care. I mean, they're, they're rapid tests. They're supposed to be, you know, th there's some idea that they might be used for point of care testing. Like in a doctor's office, he would put the thing in and then do a visit for an hour and then wait for the thing. I don't know how they think this is going to work. But they're not really point of care. They're not really rapid tests. But uh, the field is going, going there, and there may be much more user-friendly, acute HIV-capable diagnostics um, going forward. Um, the other thing, just to, I'm, I'm going to go on uh, to my last uh, sort of point, but the other point I wanted to make with the algorithms is that um, the algorithms are insisting on supplemental testing for confirmation of HIV to be done with a test that can discriminate between HIV-1 and HIV-2 and is FDA approved for, for uh, confer confirmation of HIV uh, infection. <laughs> and th there's only one of those right now, and it's a rapid test. There are two more, which I'm going to show you some data on that are, uh, is kind of cool, uh, that are uh, also uh, uh, capable of discriminating HIV 1 and 2 that are coming out. Um, finally, I just wanted to say, in terms of the CDC thing, that there is a pending revision of the HIV surveillance case definition as well. And that's, that is actually potentially going to uh, influence practice uh, by uh, public health departments uh, worldwide or, or uh, nationwide because there's going to now be uh, a uh, necessity to track and report the uh, uh, acute HIV infections. Uh, defined as HIV infection less than six months as a new reporting uh, requirement. Um, it's initially going, I think, to be probably voluntary uh, <laughs> compliance with, with reporting, but this is what the surveillance reports are going to have to look like going forward, so they're going to need to start really uh, collecting uh, prospective data on acute infection. Um, and, uh, and there's uh, uh, so I just wanted to, th th there, we've looked uh, in uh, Brazil, I'm quite involved in uh, a program called the AMPLIAR program in Brazil, which is um, a Portuguese acronym for uh, a, a, essentially a program for, a project for uh, evaluating acute infection screening methods. Uh, and we, that, that's what the AMPLIAR stands for. Uh, and we looked, uh, in the last uh, five years, we looked at about 4,000 HIV testers in the south of Brazil where there's subtype B and C infection. Uh, and everybody uh, received a fourth generation immunoassay and a rapid antibody test. And we, about half of those patients uh, got uh, uh, tested on an automated analyzer uh, to, to assess the, the ability to do rapid uh, screening for acute HIV infection in Brazil. Uh, we found 13 uh, acute infections there, and uh, every single one of uh, those in, in this had, there were six of them in this group, uh, they were all detected using the, the automated analyzer, and there was no problem with false positive results or anything like that. So that the, this rapid results algorithm for acute infection works. Uh, and by the way, every single test in Brazil uses a fourth generation um, immunoassay. It's a mandatory part of, of their uh, screening algorithm. The second thing, uh, so, so uh, th this, this surveillance thing where we need to uh, now report uh, infections less than in six months uh, is in part important because there's no current test for recent HIV infection staging. Um, and that's potentially going to change uh, the FDA has actually uh, been involved with uh, a group that I'm uh, heavily involved with. It's called the Consortium for Evaluation of Performance of HIV Incidence Assays, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and uh, we're involved in evaluating all of the, the detuned assays, all of the, the uh, tests that are used in, to estimate incidence out there. And they all rely on the principle of identifying recent HIV infection. And I'm going to show you some data now that some of the tests uh, that are coming out uh, for uh, supplemental testing for HIV actually function as recent infection tests. 
uh, and can discriminate people who are early infection from later infection. And we've actually approached the US FDA with uh, these data, and they're uh, now actually for informal discussions with this list of uh, diagnostic companies about the data that they would need to get in order to get a supplemental claim for the test that they're pushing forward for HIV disease staging. And some of those trials are actually, and those applications are going to be uh, put in in the next six months. So it's actually a very exciting kind of moment and a, a really potentially a paradigm shift in that the supplemental tests that are going to be used in the next after this, this next year when the new CDC uh, guidelines come out are potentially going to be tests that discriminate recent infection from long-term infection. Um, there's some uh, history for this, for uh, using supplemental tests for individual staging. Obviously, the um, Western blot, uh, there, people have published uh, that particular band patterns on the Western blot are associated with uh, uh, you know, long, delayed seroconversion and could be used as a, a proxy for recent infection. Uh, recently, Rick uh, Hecht, uh, in a, a paper that we worked on together, uh, looked at the, the Western blot band count, the number of positive bands on a Western blot, uh, as a proxy for recent infection, looking at seroconverters in the uh, acute infection, the NIH acute infection network that Options uh, was a large part of. Um, and it actually, the Western blot band count appeared to outperform any of the incidence tests that are supposedly developed for that purpose. But the, the problem with uh, Western blots is that they're not reproducible from lot to lot. They're, they use viral lysate. Uh, they're not you know, recombinant antigens. They're very laborious. They're very expensive. Everybody hates them. Nobody likes them. Uh, so they're going the way of the dodo. So it's sort of uh, academic at this point. Um, I mentioned the, the fact that the HIV-1-2 discriminator test uh, that's currently available, the multi-spot is a rapid test. The new ones that are coming out are also rapid tests. And they both use something called DPP technology, dual path platform technology. It's a new uh, rapid test. Uh, and I first became aware that this technology existed in my research in Brazil because the lab uh, our, our lab down there, the Ampliar lab, was involved in the initial uh, uh, evaluation of the first DPP test, which is this one here, this immunoblot. Um, and they said, you know, we've got this rapid Western blot. You know, what do you want us to do with it? And so we started uh, looking at it. As a result of their studies, it actually became approved, and it now has replaced the immunofluorescence and Western blot as the by far the most commonly performed test. Uh, in Brazil in, for supplemental testing in just one year. It's completely taken over the market because it's a rapid test. It's uh, much cheaper than a Western blot, much easier to do than an immunofluorescence assay, and everybody does it, and it's extremely reliable. Um, in addition to this uh, test, which is only available in Brazil right now, BioRad has purchased this technology, and they're coming out with something called the Genius. And they're in clinical trials. We're actually going to be one of their final uh, approval clinical trial sites, hopefully. Uh, and they're, gonna, they're, they're targeting uh, approval this summer by the US FDA, and they're going to be marketing this. Interestingly, BioRad holds the rights to, or the, they own them and market the multi-spot. They also own and market the Western blot. And I believe it's their intention that the Western blot and the multi-spot are going to go away. And I think the BioRed genius is what you will have. And this is something you better get familiar with uh, the, the results of, uh, because this is going to be your supplemental test as of this time next year. Is, it, that's my prediction. We'll, we'll see. It's there. It's on tape now. So we'll see if, if this is true. But, but uh, this is what DPP looks like. Uh, a dual path platform. So basically, this is a, looks like a regular rapid test, right, with a, the sample goes in here. But it's got two things. Um, the sample actually goes in this one down here, and then a buffer goes in afterwards in here. So this is what, so here, you know, you see, the start with the sample going in here. And uh, then you put some buffer in here. <coughs> so this is what happens. The, so you guys see this, right? This, this goes up here. Right here is a sync pad. This is like a, 
uh, it wicks all the, the fluid from the sample up here, and it, uh, and it wicks whatever you drop on here, the buffer over here, across this area, which is where the, the test lines are. And what this does is the HIV antibodies uh, that come in uh, are mixed with uh, non-HIV specific antibodies as well, right? So normally what happens is you've got a test line here, right? And let's say you've got one of these antigens is what you're testing for. Most test just for one kind, binding to one kind of antigen by one kind of HIV antibody, right? Um, the problem is that the conjugate, which has got to bind to uh, the, the bound antibodies here to show up as a signal on the test line, uh, has to compete with these guys in the mix here. So if you've got the conjugate all mixed in with the, the non-HIV specific antibodies and the HIV specific antibodies, you bind up a lot of the conjugate, you get competition for it, you also get competition for uh, binding of the, uh, the HIV specific antibodies. Oops. Uh, as well. So you, anyway, bottom line is what you do with the DPP, instead of putting everything all in uh, together, is first the HIV specific antibodies go through, they bind to the, the line here with high sensitivity because there's no interference from the conjugate. Then the conjugate is added later. By this time, the non HIV specific antibodies have been pushed off by a buffer down. Uh, into this zone, into the sync pad, and the conjugate comes in uh, with the final buffer coming from, from here, from left to right, and binds uh, with very high uh, uh, sensitivity. Uh, that, and because there's such high sensitivity to these various uh, antigens, you can use multiple antigens together. And if you do that, if you multiplex it, you end up with something that looks a lot like a Western blot. Um, the other thing that's a key difference between this and any other lateral flow rapid test is this aspect of it. This is the DPP reader that's marketed by ChemBio. BioRed has their own, which looks like this. This is the Genius reader. You notice that the BioRed test is exactly the same confirmation, the DPP thing here. Um, this one is bus powered, requires a laptop uh, interface. This one is AAA battery powered. Um, so you can use it pretty much anywhere without a computer, and it uh, prints out a, a paper printout uh, and stores the data um, here with, uh, that you can, uh, so you can upload it to a, a uh, laptop. The, what that does is it gives you a quantitative readout of the band intensity. So it turns what you know, is normally a subjective uh, semi-quantitative or qualitative result on a lateral flow test strip into a, a, an actual hard number. And because they're using recombinant antigens, the band intensity actually reflects the, uh, intense, the, the actual amount, the concentration of antibodies. Um, what we've looked at then is looking in uh, the acute infection patients who we, we've recruited in Brazil in our studies in the AMPLIAR a cohort and following them forward over time, what we've seen is that uh, this is looking at the GP160 band reflectance values on the DPP reader, uh, the values go up and they go up in a monotonic fashion uh, and with a, a relatively uh, reliable trajectory. I just want to skip forward because I know we're getting close or over. Um, but the uh, bottom line is we looked in uh, 234 uh, uh, specimens from 146 different individuals, and this is what the scatter of results uh, looking at one uh, analyte. This is the GP160 on this DPP test look like. Uh, and what you see is here, they tend to plateau, but they don't plateau for more than uh, six months. So it's actually uh, potentially something you could use for uh, incidence estimation. This is the GP120. You see a slightly different pattern. Uh, these are the four bands that are uh, the, the patterns that you see for conversion uh, of uh, band uh, positivity on 
the DPP for those. And if you look at subtype B versus subtype C, HIV infections in Brazil, uh, the, the patterns of seroconversion on this test are uh, equivalent. We looked at the uh, potential performance of interpretive criteria for recent infection uh, using this new assay. And what we found is that if you used a couple of uh, criteria, uh, either for individual uh, bands here, uh, you know, GP160 at this intensity threshold, GP120 antibodies at this intensity threshold, or a combination of other intensity thresholds, we were able to achieve multiple criteria that looked like they had a, a false recent rate, or, uh, so the equivalent of a false positive rate for a recent infection staging test of uh, far less than the 10 to 15 percent that you see with the best currently available recent infection staging test, the BED. Uh, assay, and uh, these are in the range that they would be potentially useful, not only for clinical staging, but potentially for surveillance use and incidence estimation as well. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to conclude by saying um, that in San Francisco right now, I think we have uh, really a unique opportunity to examine uh, how the epidemic and, and needed uh, prevention strategies to, to contain further HIV incidents um, are going to change. Uh, I think we're looking at a post-test and treat world, um, and we, I think we have a unique uh, view on, on that situation. Um, acute infection, you've heard, uh, I think is going to increasingly dominate uh, the lower level of uh, new infections uh, in San Francisco. Uh, but new technologies are going to make it possible to, to diagnose uh, acute infection. Uh, and particularly, uh, I just want to conclude by saying that the, uh, in, in San Francisco uh, right now, uh, I think we have an opportunity to merge both the, the, the new technologies with our SFGH model, potentially create uh, a method for rapid point of care uh, diagnosis of uh, acute HIV infection in clinical settings, in drop-in medical settings, uh, such as ambulatory care environments. Um, and this is, uh, Jen Cohen has, has just uh, signed on uh, to lead a project that's uh, being funded by a new um, NIH grant. Uh, it's going to be called the START program. And beginning in about six months, uh, the adult urgent care um, center uh, downstairs is going to be the setting for a first trial, we hope, of uh, acute uh, screening using a rapid results algorithm in the U.S. So uh, that'll, that'll be an exciting development. And um, we're going to see where things go with the DPP uh, test, but coming soon to a theater near you. And you can anticipate, uh, uh, I hope, having results that say likely recent infection or, or not. And then we're going to have to figure out what to do with those results. So that'll be next year's talk, uh, that plus the, the thing. Thank you very much, you guys. Way. I just want to remind folks that actually our HIV Insight colleagues have audio taped this and that Chris's slides will be available 